But the calculations that I do show, you know, in the next five to 10 years, I think a, a target somewhere between half a million dollars and, and a million is conservative. Um, I know people think that's crazy, uh, but the, the, the rationale behind it is that with the expansion of both the broad money supply and the Fed's balance sheet, you're going to have liquidity thrown at any deflationary event like you've never seen before. Yep. Um, in, a, in a deflationary bust, the central bank's real negative repercussions for printing are pretty much non-existent, and they will do anything they possibly can to stimulate the system. This is the Blue Collar Bitcoin Podcast, a show where average Joe firefighters explore the most important monetary technology of the 21st century. We talk Bitcoin, we talk finance, and we talk shit. Buenos dias, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome into the Blue Collar Bitcoin Podcast. Today we are joined by Joe Carlosare. Joe is a lawyer, a commercial litigator, and he's co-chair of the cryptocurrency, blockchain, and fintech group. He has been an active investor and proponent of Bitcoin since 2015. Professionally, he provides practical and legal expertise to individuals and companies on regulatory compliance and custodial solutions for digital assets. And no joke, Josh and myself, Dan, agree that Joe is one of the most well-rounded Bitcoiners we've ever come in contact with. He has the depth of knowledge and the breadth of knowledge across numerous disciplines, from financial markets to legal and political landscapes to more deep philosophical and game theoretic discussions. This conversation flew by, was a ton of fun. During our time together, we covered topics including can Bitcoin be banned, where the Fed's balance sheet may be going this decade, blacklisted Bitcoins and fungibility concerns, Joe's midterm price targets, and why he considers himself what he calls a Bitcoin money maximalist. You can follow Joe on Twitter at Joe Carlosare. That's at J-O-E-C-A-R-L-A-S-A-R-E. He is a fantastic follow and he regularly appears on Twitter spaces to talk about an abundance of topics. You can listen to even more of what he has to say by checking out the Inside Bitcoin podcast, which he is a co-host on. As always, you can follow us on Twitter at blue underscore collar BTC. If you want to support the show, check out the support section down in the show notes. And we are on podcast 2.0 platforms if you want to get frisky on the Lightning Network, plebs. All right, without further ado, here's our chat with Joe Carlosare. All views and language expressed by the hosts and guests in this podcast are solely their personal opinions and do not reflect their employers or organizations they are associated with. Do not treat any of the content in this podcast as investment advice or as an inducement to follow a particular strategy. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Joe Carlosare, welcome on the Blue Collar Bitcoin podcast. Good morning, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, coming. Pumped to chat. Um, We've heard you a lot. I would say in our head, you are one of the most well-rounded Bitcoiners we hear on a regular basis. Definitely very impressed with both your depth and breadth of knowledge. Give us a little bit about how you've procured said knowledge. What do you do? What are you up to? How did you come to Bitcoin? Uh, That's a great question. I'll give you the the short answer as possible. Um, So uh, in college, I uh, focused on sort of a multidisciplinary approach, which I think is really key to me understanding Bitcoin. I did the philosophy, political science, economics, went on to law school, focused on a lot of economics and law, constitutional questions. And really, I was very focused in the political scene. I became very involved with politics here in Illinois. And uh, after running for office locally, I sort of grew really frustrated with the system, uh, as you guys I think both know Illinois is really broken politically. Understatement. And uh, what, what led me to really sort of search and sort of peel back the layers of the onion was try to understand uh, what's at the root cause. You know, the whole money is the root of all evil. I kind of, after my political experience, I found out that I thought, um, you know, money, our, the way we value money, how money is used in our society is corrupting all of our political institutions. So that led me back to, you know, trying to figure out sound money, I think the principles of you know a, an economy that really works in the proper incentive structure, and at the same time, you know I'm in law school. I'm hearing about Bitcoin, researching it, try to understand the <clears throat> intersection between the law and all these different areas of society, and then I just dove into Bitcoin. Um, I didn't actually buy Bitcoin until 2015, uh, so I'm a ra- rather late compared to some of these guys who have been in very early. <laughs> That's but a relative I, term. 
Yeah. 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 Um, but, but once I really started playing around with it and was sending Bitcoin transactions and realizing the imp um, implications on our economic system, our political system, all nuances of our society, a light bulb just went off. And I just became so ingrained in it. And I had always traded, you know, financial markets. I had, and I've been trading since, you know, I had a custodial account. My dad gave me at like 15. I was trading stocks and options and understanding the bid ask spread and whatnot. Um, but I, it just, it all clicked. Like everything from my background, the political side of it, the economic side of it, the philosophical components, they all sort of merged into this one thing that it all makes sense. Um, it's like Plato's allegory of the cave. You, you came out of the cave and it just, your world light uh, lit up. Yeah. I mean, once you see this, this is said all the time. So it's a bit of a cliche in Bitcoin. But I mean, once you start to see this thing, it's almost impossible to unsee. But I think one of the challenges, Joe, is like to see it takes quite a bit of effort and energy. I mean, obviously not professionally like you, but like part of what uh, made Josh and I ready for this was we've kind of had a lifelong interest in economics, philosophy, and finance, like albeit as a hobby. I think we both feel we had just enough of that to kind of grok this thing. But yeah, once you, man, once it, it's right in front of your face, it never leaves. But to get people to that space is a challenge for sure. Right. And you know, what I would say to that is that um, I think you always have to begin with the end in mind. And when you look at society and look at some of the problems we're struggling with, that's what really led me to Bitcoin, seeing the problems and then the solution. You know, necessity yeah. is the mother of invention, as they say. And it seems like you got this perfect solution. It's almost poetic how it comes, you know, comes in, in the heart of the financial crisis. You get this anonymous white paper uh, trying to, to deal with issues of trust, which is at the heart of all the problems we have. How do we trust each other? How do we live together as a society? So um, for me, it's just, it, it just it was like one of those things where it, it could not be more perfect. And in history, in the human history, Things happen, uh, whether you believe in divinity or some sort of force guiding mankind, yeah. um, it, it kind of all just, it, it's too perfect. And in, in, in those situ situations, it's, it's hard to ignore it. Yeah. Is it, I, I kind of like this idea that Bitcoin is almost like an ecological reaction to, like a, a good example would be like dumping waste in a pond. That pond, the ecology in the pond is going to have some kind of response to that in order to try to clean itself, whether or not it realizes what it's doing, something is going to respond to that stimuli. And in this case, it's, it's Bitcoin that is responding to this stimulus that the Fed has literally dumped into the economy. And this is the algae that's growing to clean it up. Yeah, I like the quote from Jurassic Park, right? Nature finds a way. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's kind of, I mean, right? Isn't that, isn't that it? Yeah, like, it really Bitcoin is. It kind of emerges because of this desperate need for something humans can trust without relying on third parties. Yeah, I, I, I tweeted something. I actually tweeted a quote out from our discussion with Jeff Booth. We talked to Jeff a couple months ago. And I mean, he is totally transparent and upfront that, that he thinks that this very well may be the only viable solution out of the global economic disaster that, that we're on the precipice of. And I think it's that significant. I mean, I think this could be, when you just understand some basic napkin math about what's going on in the global economy, this really and truly could be the only viable solution to pull the Band-Aid slowly and not rip open a wound. It's kind of your thought on that. How do you, do you, do you see this? Let me, let me phrase the question this way. As Bitcoin does what we three think it's going to do, do you think it is viable to take kind of like the FOSS optimistic approach and say we could have two parallel systems and one could ease into the other and we could kind of graduate out of this mess? Or do you think it is going to be a sudden, abrupt, painful move to a hard money standard? Uh, I'm a huge fan of Jeff Booth. I talk about him all the time. I think he's fantastic. And uh, I would love to have been in your chairs interviewing him. Um, what I will say is this. Uh, I've I heard him say this many times that all these Bitcoiners hoping uh, for a you know very fast, quick transition to a Bitcoin standard to hyper Bitcoinization. Yeah. Be careful what you wish for, because that can be painful. And I, I think he's right on on that. I mean, my view is I like the inter incrementalist approach. I like the older system to die not with a bang but with a whimper, sort of yeah. slowly fading away into the background while you have this new system rising up. That's the FOSS view, I think, and I think that's the preferred one. However, uh, where things are currently constituted, my base case is I think it's a painful change. I think that with the debt levels you have and with the action that central banks are going to have to take 
to keep the system together. Um, you're going to see all sorts of strange distortions and, 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 and painful times for people that don't hold Bitcoin. I've heard Jeff use the analogy of a lifeboat. I think that's spot on. But the key thing about a lifeboat is that it can only hold so many people. Yeah. Um, there's the reality of this, guys, and I, and I, it's a painful reality. I think that the vast majority of the population turns to Bitcoin out of necessity yes. when they need to. And it's not going to be a situation where everybody just gets on board very quickly because they don't recognize the need. I mean, you talk to regular folks, and I, and I know we're on the, the blue collar podcast here. You talk to regular people, getting them to understand how our monetary system is fundamentally broken is a tall order. It takes hours and hours of research and analysis and an interdisciplinary approach. And I know I have family members that still don't get it. They say, Joe, why are you so obsessed with this? It's just an investment, right? It's just going to yeah. never go up technology. It's not that important. And what I try to explain to them is because I understand the lie at the heart of the monetary system. And I, don't, I can't tell you when, but I know this thing comes to an end. Yeah. What's going on in Lebanon right now is a great example of how this could end up going. I mean, it was maybe a, a couple of weeks or a month ago when they had a, a bank holiday and nobody could get their money out of the banks and this. And now, I mean, there's a massive upsurge in people using Bitcoin in that country because their lira is losing value at an increasingly quick rate. And they're just not, they don't have a choice. I mean, their choice is dollars if they're available, if their bank allows them and Bitcoin, which obviously we all know doesn't need anyone to give you permission to use. So a large amount of those people are transitioning to a Bitcoin standard because of necessity in that country. And that's a small microcosm of the entire world. Having the entire world go through a situation like that all at once would be unthinkable. Guys, think about the infrastructure. Think about how right now during high volatility in, in something where it's not out of necessity, it's just people recognizing the value of Bitcoin. We get Coinbase that goes down. We get most of the major exchanges that go yeah. down. You oh, can't yeah. even buy Bitcoin. Right. right. Imagine, imagine a, a, a nation that's struggling with something like you're describing there and, and, and people having to get onto these things to get Bitcoin. This is why we need every day we can to strengthen this ecosystem so that we can have people have all these different channels to get into it. Because right now we don't have anywhere near enough for this thing to grow. It will come, but it's going to take a ton of time. But going back for one, one, one second, the, the, I want to raise this. Um, you know, you think about from the perspective of the people in, in positions of power on the monetary side. Think about Jerome Powell, who just got re-upped. Think about what, he, what keeps him up at night. What keeps him up at night is an economy in free fall. And it, any Bitcoiners are very critical, I think, of the Federal Reserve. But if most of us were in those chairs, yes. we would probably do the exact same thing. Agreed. Honestly. We say this they all the time to. on the show. You, can't, you can demonize the institution. You can't demonize the person. They have, they have no freaking choice. You're, you're spot on. I mean, I think this is the... This is why I look at this thing and I say, print, do whatever you need to do to keep us out of, you know, falling into a deflationary bust where, you know, you've got tens of millions of people unemployed. Um, I know it's not, it's not, we got a lot of libertarian voices and I respect all those voices, but really we got to keep society from breaking down. And I think most Bitcoiners, like I said, if you're in that chair, you're going to do something very similar. Yeah. I'm a libertarian myself. I would consider myself one, but I understand the mechanics of why they're doing what they're doing. I mean, this is a 40, 50 year uh, in increasingly exponential problem that they simply can't band-aid fix. I mean, the only thing they can do is to print the money. So either A, they choose to stop printing, interest rates rise, everyone gets, the credit markets collapse basically. And we have a hard exit, which would be just a nightmare. It would be social unrest everywhere. It would be a disaster. Or they print money until with the whimpering end, like you mentioned. And I think of those two choices, any rational person sitting in that chair is going to take B because, uh, I mean, it gives them more time to try to figure out what to do in the long run. And it also allows this transition to happen more smoothly or as smoothly as it can. Yeah, I completely agree. Joe, this is, uh, we, we're usually a little bit too cool to talk about price. Like we like to be kind of the, the Bitcoin plebs that are sort of above talking about price in every episode but I'm going to do it anyways. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are on where we're going in market cap. We're at, let's, let's just, for simplicity's sake, call it a trillion dollar market cap today. What kind of capture do you think uh, this protocol is going to, to take out of, out of global markets? So um, the long answer is I think that it becomes bigger than the bond market. Um, the current bond market in today's dollar values 
um, and the derivatives market. Uh, wow. So you're, you know, by some estimates, you're looking at four hundred trillion dollars. Um, but that's that's long run. Yeah, these numbers kind of grow pretty meaningless from my view, yeah. because ultimately there will come a day when you will not be able to trade your fiat for Bitcoin. That's my right. belief. That may take 20, 30, 40 years. And at that point, you know, you're talking about hundreds of trillions, hundreds of millions of dollars of Bitcoin. But is it really hundreds of millions of dollars in today's dollars? No, it's not. It has to re reflect real productivity, real growth, real consumer goods and services in, the, in our society. So that, that kind of gets distorted. But let's look at like the next five to 10 years, which I think are really key. If you believe, as I do, that the economy is slowing and that you're having uh, a lower, something that Dr. Lacey Hunt talks about, the, the marginal revenue product of debt, you're having a lower bang for your buck when it comes to government spending and stimulus, that I think there's a realistic projection that the Fed's balance sheet, which is my preferred mechanism of, ma of analyzing Bitcoin, not market cap, the Fed's balance sheet is going to grow, I think, to somewhere between 30 to $40 trillion uh, up from today's levels. So in that environment, if we see you know, roughly a 10x increase or a 5x increase in the Fed's balance sheet, I've calculated it out somewhere between a 30 to 50x return in the current spot price of Bitcoin. Um, I can break down all that math. I, I'm not as good as someone like Greg Foss at doing it on the fly, but the calculations that I do show you know, in the next five to 10 years, I think a, a target somewhere between half a million dollars and, and a million is conservative. Um, I know people think that's crazy, uh, but the, the, the rationale behind it is that with the expansion of both the broad money supply and the Fed's balance sheet, you're going to have liquidity thrown at any deflationary event like you've never seen before. Yep. Um, in, a, in a deflationary bust, the central bank's real negative repercussions for printing are pretty much non-existent, and they will do anything they possibly can to stimulate the system. So the levels of, in, uh, of liquidity and stimulus, both on the fiscal side and even in the private sector, I think there's going to be compulsory um, credit creation that's going to eventually come from this. It's going to be unprecedented. And that, that's really what I look at. I, Bitcoin, to me, it's, it's, it's fun to talk about price, but ultimately you have something that perfectly fits the moment and the need. So, uh, you know, and I think people are going to be happy any price north of half a million dollars, frankly, at least what they're holding now. People listening to this thinking that's absurd. I mean, five years ago in January, February of 2015, where we were looking at $1,000. And here we are sitting at, I didn't even look at the price today, probably around 57,000, 57X in the last five years. And that was without this backdrop of this, I mean, sure, the money printing's been going on, but it's accelerated significantly. And it's going to have to keep accelerating in order to keep it all together. So I don't think that that is an outrageous thing to think might happen at all. Josh, think, think about this. Go back and look at news articles and look at mainstream people, even on the left, five to 10 years ago, and ask them what they thought of UBI. Ask them if they thought universal yeah. basic income was a reality or Very something true. we would eventually. It, 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 was, it was completely obscure, sort of uh, you know, uh, eccentric philosophy on the left to, to move to UBI. It's becoming mainstream. We had presidential candidates in, on the Democratic side advocating for this openly in the last presidential election. So, so the sea change of the Bitcoin price, the reason I bring that up is if you move to something like UBI, if you move to something where you know, the government has to stimulate in that way, the, the repercussions on Bitcoin are absolutely astronomical. Like, yeah. I mean, it's hard to even fathom when you have currency that's being debased like that at a direct level through the Fed buying up bonds that are stimulated, that are being uh, issued to cover the UBI. Uh, it's just a new realm. It's a whole new world. And what's so dramatic there is now we have a digital bear asset with serious opportunity for liquidity to move around. I was thinking about this, looking at what's going on in Turkey this morning. There is an option right now. Like if, you, if you're trapped in Turkey 60 years ago, trying to escape to hard, scarce assets is incredibly challenging. Like getting your hands on gold or uh, real estate or whatever, what have you, that you. That's not something you can do instantaneously in one afternoon. We now have an opportunity, even if there's regulatory oversight for someone to flick on a VPN, the opportunities to move into a store of value asset like Bitcoin, I think, need to be considered along with the motivations to do so. Like you now have the opportunity to make that exit in a way you never have in mankind's history. 
Absolutely. And, and it's not just to escape to the asset because, of course, you know, in, in Turkey, they could ex escape to gold, right? They could keep those gold bars in their basement. The problem with that is, though, like, it, okay, you need to eat, right? You need, you need to trim off some of that right. to, to survive. And what, what are you going to chip off little pieces of the gold? That, it's just not practical. So you're going to have to, you know, with Bitcoin, though, you don't have to worry about that. You could sell just a fraction of the Bitcoin to then live and survive in a very, um, you know, turbulent time or turbulent place. Uh, that's, that's a game changer for people. And the ability to, say, to sell it out, technically outside of your country, right? You could be in Turkey, with, your, like you said, with your VPN and sell just a portion of it. As long as you can get those, those whatever native currency, the lira, back into your, your local uh, country, you're good. Or peer to peer. Yeah. Joe. Did you see what Hillary Clinton said about uh, Bitcoin becoming a threat to the U.S. to the uh, hegemony of the dollar at that? Uh, I, I forget yes. the the forum she was at. So one of the I think one of the meaty questions that we wanted to get to with you is so I, I think we would agree that the U.S. has been pretty lax with how they've dealt with Bitcoin. I mean, they've not really had a choice, but they also they haven't really enforced anything hard, whether or not they realize if they can. But. I wanted to ask you just from your experience being a lawyer and what you know about the law and how this could all go. I know this seems extreme to think that they could just come out tomorrow and say that this is banned and they could do something like the uh, like FDR did in the 30s with uh, the 6102 gold uh, grab when they literally said, everybody, bring your gold bars. We're going to pay you $20 today. And then, you know, overnight, they reprice gold to $35 an ounce. What is your what are your thoughts on? the ability they might have to do something like that. Maybe your, your view on the probabilities that something like that could happen. And then what would be your recommendations for how somebody could protect themselves from a situation like that? Great question. I'm going to tackle it in a couple of different pieces. I'll start by saying that I fully expect governments to implement more harsh regulations on Bitcoin and a larger cryptocurrency space. I think it's a matter of when, not if. Um, but what I will say is con different from the 1930s or re earlier periods in our history. I think that the system of law in the United States, and what I mean by that, the court system really, I think is more refined and it, it is uh, uh, better constituted to handle these issues than it was even in the 1920s and 30s. Um, I think tomorrow, if there came out a ban that said you can no longer hold Bitcoin or transfer Bitcoin, I'd be one of the first people in court challenging it both personally and uh, as uh, on behalf of my clients, because I don't think such a law, whether it comes from an executive order or from an act of Congress, I don't think it's constitutional. I think it runs afoul of numerous constitutional provisions. I was actually thinking about writing an article up on this, but um, you banning, a, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Banning a technology like Bitcoin, uh, I think it runs, uh, basically it, it completely runs afoul of all of our property rights and due process rights. I don't think you can do it at this point. However, I do think that the government can make the lives of Bitcoin is much more difficult to transact in Bitcoin, to make tax issues, a complete headache, all of which I expect to come at some point. But ultimately, the people and uh, the adoption rate of this will act as a counterweight to our political system to push back against such draconian um, uh, legislation and, and, rule, and, and rules put forward by uh, policymakers. So that's my view. I think, you know, uh, Josh, you may have called it when we were talking earlier uh, FUD about it. I don't think it's FUD. I do think the reason I say that is because I do think you're going to see some of this. I mean, governments are not going to go quietly into the night on this thing. They're going to fight. But the question is, will they win? And I don't think they will, um, because I think right now you've got really two sets of people in Washington. You've got the folks that um, I think understand Bitcoin for what it is and its potential. People like Hillary Clinton, and she's right on this. This will dis disrupt dollar hegemony in the long run. Um, and then you got the folks that just dismiss it outright as some sort of Ponzi scheme. I think right now the dominant view among policymakers is the Ponzi scheme. This is just to scam people. It's not really to, to be taken seriously. That's where most folks are. The smarter policymakers are getting to understand what potential this has, and they're trying to bring everybody else along. But ultimately, the politicians in Washington and politicians in countries all over the world they're going to have to deal with a population who, who wants this, who's going to elect leaders that promote Bitcoin and promote crypto generally. Yeah, I'm, I was thinking the two things that popped to mind when you were saying that is I absolutely think you're right. It would be totally unconstitutional, but the way they would frame it would be twofold, in my opinion. It would be a national security threat. So it would be some kind of very, very quick presidential order that would 
kind of like these uh, the vaccine mandates in a way. Like whether or not this is constitutional, we don't really care at this point. We're just going to force this down your throat because it's a national security threat, and that's a very very cohesive way for them to 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 run something quickly without interference. Similar to to interject, similar to your comment on UBI about narratives changing and perspectives changing and not to get too far down the vaccine hole here, but I think a lot of people would be blown away at the club the government is wielding in terms of mandating vaccines in this day and age. So you're kind of seeing how that barometer is moving over time. I, I just am resonating with you, Josh, that I think that that tone and perspective could continue to change in what people accept as viable and appropriate behavior in terms of freedom infringement seems to yeah. be moving in a in a, at least in our view in a concerning direction. And I think this double the, the two points that they'll use in my opinion to to run this will be national security and bitcoin and these evil libertarians have destroyed our economy and try to turn it against itself in a way. Yeah, I I, I agree. I think those those concerns and justifications, the, the stated purpose for why they're doing it, are, you're spot on. That's what it's going to be. But remember, once Bitcoin gets to the level where it actually is obvious to any policymaker yeah. this is posing a threat, it's going to be broad spread throughout the population. You're going to have millions. You have millions of people right now in the United States. You're going to have tens of millions of people that hold this asset. And they become uh, political advocates for this. And, uh, you know, Dan, you brought up the issue of the vaccines. Well, look how divided the country is on vaccines. Look how you've got people that, uh, politicians included, state, local, federal uh, political leaders that are opposed to vaccine mandates. They go out there every day and speak about it. I see a similar tension coming with Bitcoin because you've got a handful of senators right now that are supportive of the technology generally. I don't think we have a true Bitcoin senator, even Lummis. Um, but take the point that at that level, you're going to have, a, I think, a whole political party potentially or fractions of different political parties that are saying, no, we think this is the path forward. You can't push us back. We have to move forward. We're not going to try to suppress this because we frankly can't, number one. And two, we could potentially be at the forefront of this globally if we get on board. So with our political system, there's never a monolith. There's always factions on different sides of everything. And the same thing will be true of Bitcoin. Yeah. And I like that. You have to think about the tremendous amount of wealth that when we, if we get to that stage, that will have wedged its way into all corners of the domestic and global economy. Um, I think, I think you're right and astute to say it doesn't appear to be coming anytime soon. Like as we said off the top, the perspective of the U.S. government towards this asset has really blown my mind. I mean, we've only been in it since 2017, but I, I expected. Um, a lot more offense against it. Like I, I am, I am pleasantly surprised at the disposition of the of regulators and and politicians towards this asset right now. What I think is so interesting is like, and this is a very Gladstein idea. I think he talks about this in his Trojan Horse article. The gold 2.0 and the store value narrative. If you know much about Bitcoin, it's hard to imagine that this thing is going to stop there. Like I remember when I first got interested in Bitcoin, that's kind of what I latched onto. Like, oh, this is probably going to be a you know five to fifteen trillion dollar asset. It's going to increase the amount of store of value in the economy. It's going to take a, a notch out of gold. But once you understand the dynamics of this protocol and network, and then you transpose the macro backdrop that's currently in existence, I think most well-researched Bitcoiners would agree that how in the world this thing is this thing going to stop at ten trillion if it gets to that mark? Right. But once it yeah. gets to that mark, Joe, there, that's a lot of wealth. Like to, to try to totally curtail a 10, 15, 20 trillion dollar market cap, I mean, easier said than done. I, I don't know what else to say. And I think that's a lot of what you're alluding to. Exactly. Think about it like this, Dan. Um, say there's a, there's a candidate out there who makes this whole political campaign we need to stop Bitcoin, we need to crush it. Right. Imagine the opposite, like a major presidential candidate, say that were Joe Biden's position and if he ran for re-election. Um, imagine the amount of support and money at that level when you're at a $10 trillion market cap, financial support, the hardest money out there, the, 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 the preferred uh, store of value. How much is that going to be contributed to the opposing political candidate? Any person, you know, if Dan or Josh wants to stand up and run for president, I, can, I will 
fully guarantee in fiat terms, there's going to be tens of millions of dollars in your coffers very quickly from Bitcoiners out there advocating for what has made them very wealthy. Um, it's the self-reinforcing effect where you know the more the higher Bitcoin's price goes, it has an impact on our political system. And this goes back to what I said earlier. You know, from my political experience, you know, you learn very quickly how much money matters in campaigns. It drives the entire thing. And there will there's a ton of politicians who take policy stances just because they know they're going to get money from the banking sectors or you know well-heeled uh, parts of society. And the same is going to be true for Bitcoin. Politicians are going to respond to this fast growing asset class with you know hundreds and hundreds of new multimillionaires in fiat terms. And they're going to say, I want that support group. I want that backing. I think one other key difference between now and say the early 1930s when FDR did go through with that uh, executive order is that information is literally everywhere now. The decentralization of information and understanding and all of the things and all the people like Gladstein's a great example, putting out these incredible articles every couple of weeks that help people understand and really internalize the, the arguments and the importance of all this. When people really have a fundamental intellectual idea about why this is and then see something like that happen, it gives them a whole lot of firepower and ability to to help people to help other people understand the reasoning why this is a bad idea. And I don't think in the the thirties there was that ability to disseminate information besides the propagandized arm of the state, maybe with, you know, some of the bigger newspapers. I mean, I think that the information is so much more available now that it would be much harder to make their point. I agree. And, and even if you study that, the 6102 attack, um, you know, it, it wasn't broadly enforced. There was just a handful of prosecutions for violating it. And ultimately, I think they concluded the law was impractical. And I do believe there are, there are judges now in prominent federal courts um, that have said it was unconstitutional. Had there been the right challenges afforded? Uh, so from my perspective, I think that's kind of a vestige of a bygone era. Um, I think if you think that uh, 6102 is possible in terms of Bitcoin, uh, you have to understand technologically it's much more difficult than gold. That's a huge part. And politically, yeah. I don't think it's going to be viable. Yeah. Um, to steel man this before we move on, based on your legal expertise, uh, what regulatory or legal strategies could governments take that do make you pucker a little bit that do scare you what's kind of on your radar there well do you mean with with bitcoin or just crypto generally let's let's start with bitcoin so i actually think the status quo on bitcoin is as i think you've heard me say is, is pretty favorable right now i hope that we don't get new requirements um imposed on the on and off ramps. I think that's the most likely scenario how they deal with this. Chair Gensler of the FCC seems very fixated on the idea of greater controls and quote unquote investor protections for these fiat on ramps and exchanges. Uh, if that becomes the case, it's going to be harder to acquire Bitcoin, harder to sell Bitcoin for fiat while we're still on a fiat standard. So that's, that, that's the main point of attack. I mean, the, since its inception, as you, you both know, I think, the, the real Achilles heel of Bitcoin has always been, how do you get dollars into this asset space? Because once you're in Bitcoin, things become infinitely uh, more simple. The, the problem is getting dollars in there and then you get this issue with like this big honeypot of Bitcoin where people don't remove their coins off the exchange and so forth. And they want to have the flexibility of being on there. That's the Achilles heel of Bitcoin in my mind, the exchange. Now, I know hardcore Bitcoiners say that's not an issue, just withdraw your coins. But we as a, psycho as a society, our psychology is not yet up to, up to that, that sort of social norm. We have to move to the point where people are comfortable. Even my brother, who I've been harping on about Bitcoin for years now, he still is hesitant to move coins off exchange. He doesn't feel comfortable with it. He likes being able to open the app maintained by someone else and view it. Um, that's really going to be challenging as we get on tens of millions of more people into this space, teaching them to trust the technology and to learn. Uh, so I think that's where the government's going to focus its, its efforts. Uh, they're going to focus it on the front of exchanges. What are your thoughts on, um, so Eric Voorhees comes to mind. Um, we love talking about him. His, uh, his exchange, I can't remember. Oh, Shapeshift. Shapeshift. That's it. Shapeshift. They're turning that into a decentralized autonomous organization, which with the intention of basically keeping this thing completely out of the reach of the state. As they make these regulations more onerous for some of these exchanges. Do you think 
there is any attack vector at all for that kind of a an institution that is literally not run by anybody it, I, it, ideally we all know that there's degrees of decentralization and all that but let's assume they're successful and there are some of these decentralized exchanges i mean this is just a vampire squid that is just going to squeeze through those cracks in the floor on them and they're just never going to be able to affect any kind of regulatory regulatory uh, capture that will have any meaningful teeth what are your what are your thoughts on that in general so um with decentralized exchanges or DAOs, the real key question you have to analyze it um, in the framework of is, can it be shut down in any way? And I think the problem I have with a lot of these things, mostly let's start with the DEXs, is that yes, the protocol itself is decentralized. It's just computer code out there, but the front end, the maintenance of it, putting up even something as simple as a website so people can find it and identify it in the Google search, all of that are points of attack. Bitcoin doesn't have any of these flaws, so that's really shows you why it's unique in that effort. But but the actual exchanges, all these DEXs, every single one of them, I think currently constituted, I've never seen one that couldn't be shut down by a regulator or a policymaker or an enforcement uh, agency. That that's the key distinction for me. So if you know Shapeshift, and I and I know Boris obviously, but I don't know what his current intention is with with this DAO that he's trying to set up. If it is constituted in such a way where it can uh, have a point of attack that can be shut down then it's not really decentralized, yeah. right? Yeah, That's my main, my main takeaway for that. So show me something that a government cannot stop, and then I think it's decentralized. And I think the other thing I want to add here is if these technologies or this technology, Bitcoin, is relegated to a niche, small, esoteric, highly technical community, like they may be able to nerd out on it for a few decades, but if there's not liquidity channels and money that can move in, this thing's not going to grow and take a significant bite out of the out of global economy. And it's not going to fix base layer money if it's, once again, relegated to this small group of people. And I think that's some of the risk you're identifying, Joe, if I'm understanding you right, about cutting off these rails for less informed folks that are new and nascent to the asset class. Like, yes, we can say, you know, you should have non KYC coin join multi sig Bitcoin, yeah. but most people just don't even know what that means. And they're just looking to get some exposure in their Roth IRA. And I understand where we're trying to go, but in the midterm, like it still matters that people be able to get certain levels of exposure. At least that's our opinion. And I'm assuming you agree. I completely agree. And, and I think from a Bitcoiners, we're trained uh, to. I think deep in the ethos, deep in the culture of Bitcoin to assume worst case scenario, right? To assume what could the government come down and clamp down on us and try to squish this thing. Um, I think you need to start thinking more positively. I think we all need to start thinking more positively. Like what can we do on a regulatory front to actually encourage Bitcoin adoption? And I'll give you a very simple thing. A de minimis tax exemption would go, that would drive adoption probably more than hedge funds, you know, buying it up or, or Fortune 500 companies. If you were able to spend your Bitcoin, space, say, spend 500 bucks in a week um, and not have to face tax consequence of it, think about how many people would be out there with new Bitcoin in their hand for every small little transaction here and there. Think about how people could get, uh, get exposed to this. Those sorts of things, I think Bitcoiners discount the possibility for favorable um, legislation and favorable rulemaking coming down. Uh, so I really try to, you know, talk to your senator, talk to your congressman, talk to your local officials about incentives you can to drive Bitcoin transaction volume. Because right now, um, we always we're just analyzing how do we protect against the worst case scenario, and that it's helpful, but it's not the whole focus. It shouldn't be the whole focus, rather. Yeah, I want to just before we move on to the positivity, I just have one more concern that I want to hear you air out and talk about. Sure. Which is coin joining. Keep, pet, keep petting it. our hair, Joe. We need yeah. you to. We need <laughs> In, you to console us. I don't think. Well, I don't think there's any way that they can stop coin joining. But do you think the fungibility of Bitcoin in general? Do you think that these K? I know a lot of these KYC exchanges already won't accept coin joined Bitcoin uh, into their coffers. Do right. you see this becoming uh, an issue in the near future, where where politicians might try to attack those specific types of coins, saying they very possibly have some kind of criminal nature behind them, and this is now an illegal activity to join to coin join, and those coins are almost blacklisted? How do you how do you see that going? Yeah, it, they're absolutely going to try that. In fact, if you know anything, um, 
I got to be careful what I can say about this, but there, you know, most major exchanges um, already do that to some degree. There's there's blacklisted coins. I think everybody knows that. And and the interesting part about it is that a lot of this is voluntary, voluntary, right? Based on the 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 rules of different exchanges, some will have lists where they're not going to take you know so code right. coins. They're not going to take certain types. So that's going to continue. I think there's a high probability it extends to some sort of regulation or legislation as well to sort of have a have a department that can blacklist certain coins and say you can, no major U.S. exchange can accept these particular coins as identified, and if they're coin joined, it, uh, you've, you've voided your warranty, right? Like you, it's it, it's similarly as being tainted. Um, that's going to come, but the, but I think it ultimately fails. I think it's the type of thing where where Bitcoiners will say, okay, uh, even though they're perhaps not uh, improved, uh, their their blacklisted tokens will take those tokens and will sell them peer to peer and and transact in them. I think that's yeah, like so a scenario. black market appears. Yeah. And you might also see some, uh, you know, we kind of see this in certain uh, pockets. Uh, now you might see some price distortions, right? There might be the, the premium you pay for the clean, pristine coins versus a discount for blacklisted coins. You're going to see stuff like that. I think eventually, I think it all goes away in the long so, run though. <clears throat> it's kind of like social media in a way then where it's not, you know, the first amendment rights not being stripped of you. If Facebook deal, you know, deplatforms you, um, but you're effectively being silenced. So it's kind of the same thing where they're going to have or put pressure on these companies in order to not allow coin joins. Even if there wasn't a law, this is still going to take some effect, yeah. obviously. But Josh, that only matters in the sense of trying to get fiat, right? And if Bitcoiners, <laughs> right. Bitcoiners want Bitcoin, they don't want yeah. fiat. So eventually, if you get to the, the quote unquote hyper, hyper Bitcoinization, who cares about the fiat transfer? I mean, all these issues go by the wayside when the preferred uh, unit of account and, and medium of exchange becomes Bitcoin, right? This is, again, the Achilles heel has always been the exchanges. It will continue to be for the foreseeable future until Bitcoin takes over. Right. I want to push back just a little on that because let's say 10 years from now, I decide I want to buy a house and I want to use Bitcoin, but the counterparty won't accept coin joined Bitcoin. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I, right. I, I appreciate what you're saying there, but I just think that they're I mean, the implications could be outside of just having to try to get fiat if if people are willing to take uh, take Bitcoin for a transaction like that. Yeah. And in, in your analogy, in 10 years, if the counterparty that's selling their house won't take the hardest money and the preferred money that everybody's trying to get their hands on, let's assume that's the case, I guarantee you there will be other people out there offering services to say, fine, I'll take your Bitcoin and I'll give cash for the house yeah. because I'm desperate to get this asset. No, you're and absolutely it, right about that. So, so maybe it's a little more clunky and there may be a step or two more involved, but if Bitcoin succeeds and everybody's desperate to get their hands on the 18 million or whatever it is, 14 million that are really in circulation, um, then I think that you have all these issues smoothed out and there's ways to get around them. Yeah. The other thing to consider here, which we talk about on the show is, I mean, and, and we're right on the heels of Taproot, the significance of uh, backwards compatible protocol upgrades that improve fungibility and privacy. Like this thing really can sh uh, shift shape without any regulator having any say. I mean, when you when you think about the privacy upgrade that the node operators and miners just agreed on with Taproot, and then you start and I'm not we're not super well versed, but you start to understand sort of future plans for things like cross input signature aggregation. I do think the fungibility concerns are going to diminish and. There's really not much of anything any government or regulator is going to be able to say about it. Like it just, you're going to be able to track certain coins one way, and then ten years later, you're not because the protocol is going to spin move on you. And and even uh, changes outside the base protocol, right? Like Lightning, the privacy right. that comes with Lightning. If Lightning continues to take off and grow and see the the, the exponential growth we're seeing on it, that's going to add a whole new medium of pol of, of privacy uh, features. So. One thing we really are excited to pick your brain about today is uh, ETFs and GBTC. I've heard you talk about this quite a bit. Why don't you give us just your high-level view of the futures ETF that just got approved, um, your thoughts on GBTC, what future you see for a spot ETF, that sort of thing. So, um, and, and I've been very consistent on this for two years now. I think that the spot ETF is farther away than people think. Um, it, it's a type of thing where I think the futures ETF on balance is a really positive development because it's a signal that we recognize this thing is a commodity. 
We recognize that this is something that is not a security. We're going to allow it to be traded in regulated markets. It's a terrible product. I don't encourage anyone to buy it um, for because of contango and bleed and, and the contract uh, role. But ultimately, it, it's a signal to institutional money that this is not going away. It will be here for the long run. And there are now more and more regulated products that you can use to trade it. Terrible regulated products, but products nonetheless. The ETF is a whole other creature. The spot ETF, which I think is what we really want to have happen. Um, I personally think it. I want it to be delayed as long as possible. I don't want people to uh, gravitate towards the ease of an, a spot ETF um, to just transfer. Yeah, I transfer billions or trillions of dollars into it. I think it it becomes a point of vulnerability. Um, on balance right now, if you had a spot ETF that was approved, I think you're going to see a lot more folks just buying the spot ETF and not custodying their own coins. I don't, I hope that doesn't happen. I think when a spot ETF gets approved, I want Bitcoin to be well north of five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000, because I think that it, at that point, people are going to say, wait a second, why do I want to put my Bitcoin in a vehicle like this when I could just hold it? and hold it in a secure right. fashion with new custody. And it also gives you that ability to use it in other ways. Decentralized finance, if that, whenever that becomes something that's more viable and less risky, if you want to you know, lend your Bitcoin out to somebody and make some interest on it, it's, it's, you know, that path is available to you. Whereas with an ETF, you're just simply getting the exposure to the price. We, yeah, we don't know what the future opportunities could be for bearer Bitcoin. Like you could have, as you, it, we've been messing with Lightning Network, opening liquidity channels on our nodes and stuff the last couple months. And who knows exactly where Lightning's going, but Preston Pish talks about this. And, and as I've explored Lightning, like I agree, like you could lock up Bitcoin completely risk-free in a future where Lightning is proliferating and is a huge part of, of money transfer and get yeah. yield on your Bitcoin with literally zero risk. Like these are opportunities you forego. And I'm not saying getting, you know, buying derivatives and, and mining stocks and stuff is a terrible decision, but you are foregoing the opportunities that could come on this protocol by having the actual underlying. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's, it, I look at it as kind of a perversion of Bitcoin to buy an ETF that just holds a bunch of Bitcoin. Um, it's not what it, it's, it's forcing the old world paradigm on the new world paradigm, which yeah. I think is always something you're going to regret in the long run. But let me go back for a second because I want to explain why I'm, I'm pretty bearish on a, on a spot ETF here. Um, and, and the FTC, I think many were hopeful that they would pivot after the approval of the futures ETF and change course. In reality, they've been uh, remarkably consistent going back to 2018 and all of their ETF denials as to why they're denying it. Um, they have said numerous times that there are structural issues with the Bitcoin market and how global it is and the potential for manipulation in the offshore leveraged derivative exchanges. Um, the fact that they can't look under the hood as to what's going on in there and if there's potential market manipulation is something that is causing them to have concerns and the burden is on the applicant for the ETF to prove that those are not legitimate concerns. So they've said this in 2018, they said it in 2019, 2020, and now they just issued a double down order again saying that the most recent ETF that got denied, the spot ETF that got denied, hasn't demonstrated that those concerns raised by the SEC are not legitimate. In other words, they haven't proven that there isn't quote unquote manipulation occurring in these overseas markets. Well. Now, just think about that. If the FCC is saying that after they're denying the futures ETF and they're placing the burden on the applicant to prove definitively, at least by uh, clear and convincing evidence, that there is no manipulation, how do you overcome that, guys? How do you show that that isn't a real concern? If I'm trying to advise somebody on uh, the process or procedures for getting an ETF approved, I'm going to say you're going to have to present data from all these exchanges overseas that aren't going to give you the data to prove that there's no spoofing going on or no issues, and it's exceedingly difficult. Now, the other argument, the argument, uh, just one thing that you can, um, you can raise to push back against that is you could say, well, the majority of the liquidity is in the United States, the majority of the trading volumes in the United States. If you could prove that, then yes, then what happens overseas doesn't matter as much and the SEC is not gonna be as concerned. But we all know, I think, I think you're both aware that the majority of the trading volume, the majority of the, the, the activity, the leverage, it's all outside the United States. So until there's a flip flop and all that comes home and you got huge liquidity and volume in the U.S., you're not going to be able to appease uh, the SEC. I don't think so. So 
if they're worried about that, they're worried about, um, you know, murky things in the darkness overseas affecting the yeah. price in some way. How does that, how is that any different with the futures ETF? Maybe this is a basic question, but I honestly don't understand how a spot ETF, uh, because I mean, they're all based on the price, the spot price eventually. So if there's manipulation going on, no, no. okay. No, Can you explain? Cause I, I don't yeah. understand that then. Absolutely. And it's a great question. And I will tell you, once we get to the logic behind it, you're going to be very frustrated because it's a frustrating logical conclusion. But basically, here's what it is. The futures ETF is a vehicle that is holding paper contracts on the price of Bitcoin. Those paper contracts, those futures contracts are traded on the CME. Right. So the futures contract price can, and this says it, says it right in their filings, it can wildly vary from the spot price of Bitcoin. And if you ever want to look this up, look at the spot price of Bitcoin at any given time, and then pull up the CME futures contracts and see, you know, the continuous contract, see the difference between that and the spot price. It's, sometimes it gets up to two, three, four hundred dollars $400. And from the SEC's perspective, they're saying, well, we don't really care what happens in the underlying spot price. Yeah. We trust the CME. The CME and their paper <laughs> product, which is supposed to loosely reflect the Bitcoin spot price, that's all that as long as that marketplace is secure, we're going to let investors get the ETF. It's almost like ignorance is bliss in a way. Right. Exactly. So, so, so here's, here's the flaw in the logic. Here's the flaw in the logic. If you are trading the paper product, if you're trading the futures contract, if you're buying the contract, selling the contract, either way, you have to hedge in the spot market. That's what the market makers do. Right. Mm -hmm. And who's hedging? Like, that's the real question. Who's buying those? C if you're, you know, if you're selling CME contracts, futures contracts out there, and you're hedging in the Bitcoin spot market, where are you hedging? How are you hedging? Is it hedged overseas? Is it hedged with U.S. institutions? And the SEC's logic, if you follow to, through to its conclusion, it just says, we don't care. We don't care how they hedge. We don't care what happens in the spot market. All we want to know and, re and we, all we care about really is that that CME market where the paper products are traded, the contract, that that is secure and we can be 100% confident in it. So here's one thought or question, and I'm, I'm a dunce in this space, so this may make no sense, but I'll take a shot in the dark. I understand the concerns with the futures ETF. I understand maybe it's going to lead to more volatility, but at some point, it's going to... It, I mean, this is it, spot is in play. Like here, here's the way I I'm thinking it through in my head. So, let's say you have tons of money flowing into ETFs like this ProShares Bitcoin Strategy ETF, right? And um, the futures price is driven up. The curve goes into contango. Well, you're going to have these cash and carry traders, right? That are going to try to arbitrage this out, and they're going to be right. buying some spot Bitcoin, right? So correct. Like I understand it's not the real deal, but eventually spot comes into play no matter how far out of whack that curve gets, right? Because there's going to be people that want to arb that out. Is what I'm saying making sense there? It, it, it makes complete sense. And um, you're correct. If you're in the futures market in a big way, any professional money manager who's using those futures contracts, who's buying them or selling them, they have to move into the spot market which they either have to buy Bitcoin or sell, depending on which side of the trade they're on. Now, the buying and selling, again, of the spot market, it's just that those are the, 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 the market makers, right? They're, they're influencing the spot market. They can decide where and when, how to sell. But if you ever hear about like the issues of the CME gap and like how you have to, you, you, this always goes on and on, uh, they talk about it on, uh, on Bitcoin Twitter a lot. What, that, what they're really meaning is that once the CME opens and closes, depending on you know, what the price of Bitcoin is, they, choose to, they try to close gaps. In other words, market makers will sell Bitcoin or drive the price of Bitcoin up to move to certain levels. So it is, you're right. It all comes back to the spot market. It's all, it is a derivative of the spot market. But from the SEC standpoint, they don't care what's going on in the stop, spot market as long as the paper market is secure. That's yeah. literally their logic. Let's talk GBTC. Uh, Josh and I have a similar perspective here, and I know you agree. We're always looking for counter arguments, but like I've been taking, I don't know, the last number of months when the price dips, I've been taking a slightly larger position in my retirement accounts because that's the only money I have left to throw at this thing. Um, <laughs> so, I, and, and when I'm, you know, when I'm there about to click the trade, like 
looking at the 15% discount to NAV that exists in GBTC right now, the word inevitable is a strong word, but it seems incredibly likely that whenever a spot ETF comes, Grayscale is going to be granted one. I mean, they have more Bitcoin than anyone in the world. Talk to us about your thoughts. Are you bullish on GBTC as, a, as an option if you're looking for exposure in that sort of area? Yes, I'm not giving any individual investment or legal advice here, but I'll just tell you, I think that uh, I don't personally own GBTC. Um, I used to own it at one point, uh, but I, I'm p- pretty bullish on the, the vehicle itself because as you point out, they've got the Bitcoin. Uh, once the ETF, once any ETF gets approved, there's a process which they can issue an identical registration statement with the SEC and get fast track approval. So uh, it's not going to be the type of situation where one ETF, spot ETF gets the market and GBTC is years down the line for approval. It will be near the, the if not the first one, it'll be near the front of the pack. So that, take that uh, as it was a word of vote of confidence for GBTC. But regarding the discount, I think what you'll see uh, right now, because you're seeing more and more products come on the market, the futures products, the Canadian ETFs, I think you'll continue to see this trade at discount until you get one of two scenarios. Number one, you get some sort of parabolic move in Bitcoin where you know Bitcoin's two, three, four hundred grand next year, somewhere around there, and investors are clamoring to get access to it. I think at that stage, you do see the premium. Um, it's just, you, you do see a trade at a premium once again, uh, because the investors will be desperate to get access in any way to this market. Absent some sort of parabolic move, I think it trades at a discount for the long run until you get the approval of the spot ETF. What are your thoughts? Speaking of paper derivatives markets, um, there was some fodder on Twitter between Foss and a couple other people about how um, I, I know a lot of people suspect that the gold markets have been manipulated over the course of the last 20, 30 years with paper markets. What are your thoughts on uh, that kind of manipulation potentially happening with Bitcoin and maybe how that might be different because Bitcoin is completely auditable? Well, we can see exactly how many coins there are. Unlike gold, you can't see how much gold is where, or really audit that. What are your thoughts on that um, line of thought? Um, so let's start with the gold market. And um, the, the, the traditional definition that the SEC imposes uh, for manipulation, and I know we throw this around colloquially, but, colloquially, but I'm a definition person. It's, it's a transaction that creates, uh, creates an artificial price or tries to maintain an artificial price with a security. Um, now, that definition, when you apply it to Bitcoin, I think you have to struggle to understand how they're going to be able to do that in, the, in this market because of the liquidity. I think manipulation in Bitcoin, if you're, if you're a whale that just sells a thousand Bitcoin very quickly and drives on the price, that's not manipulation. I don't think that falls under that definition uh, any more than if Elon Musk decides to sell all of his Tesla stock, he's going to drive the price down, but that's not manipulation of the market. Um, now, the manipulation they talk about, like there's a famous, I think it's a JP Morgan case that I looked into a few years back about manipulation of the gold market. And what's fascinating, if you go research that case, ultimately the position that was um, arrived at uh, by the regulators looking into it was that they were able to manipulate the price of gold somewhere between three to five cents in a short period of time before they could, uh, before it took off in different directions. That's the kind of manipulation they're talking about. They're ta- now, I think the gold bugs out there, they try to tell you, well, if gold weren't manipulated, it would be $5,000 <laughs> Yeah, hour. Oh, yeah. I think that's nonsense. Okay. This uh, minor de minimis manipulation of the price by a few pennies here or 10, 20 cents. Sure, it's possible. I have no doubt it, it occurs. There's too much money there for it not to. But ultimately, if you're trying to do that with Bitcoin, because of the, as you point out, the open source ledger and because of the insane public demand out there, you're going to get absolutely crushed eventually. You, yeah. you're, you're, the only way to manipulate it, just think about this. The only way to suppress the price of Bitcoin, for example, is set up a huge buy wall or sell wall, excuse me, a sell wall on exchange. And you'd have to set it up on all the exchanges, by the way, you know, cross platform at the same time, identically, you set up these massive sell walls. And guess what? If you're silly enough to do that and investor demand is high, those coins are going to get eaten up and they're going to be in the hands of strong hodlers that are not going to sell and they're not going to put that in place. So, you know, going back in Bitcoin from many years ago, there was this, you can look it up. There was this, this bear whale that was trying to quote unquote, great story. I love the bear whale, by the way. Yeah. 
Well, it illustrates the point that at the end, most of those coins got eaten up and taken by people that wanted those coins. And, you know, he, he would have been better off just holding his Bitcoin. Um, so I don't really buy the manipulation narrative. I think that you'll see some uh, short term constraints and efforts to perhaps, you know, keep the price at a certain level because they're hedged again in the in the futures market. They're trying to uh, make sure their contracts expire. But once those sell walls get lifted, price takes off. Yeah, I think. I think a lot of the maybe misunderstanding in this is like it's it's the thought of like a poker game at a poker table where somebody can bluff. And if you've got a money printer that you can use ad infinitum, you can continually bluff and never show your cards in a paper settled market. I think that's the kind of that's the kind of an idea that that kind of underpins this. Like how long can if this was a state attack, let's say, like if they wanted to manipulate these markets with paper derivatives and they had the ability to bluff um, with no end. How is that a totally insane tinfoil hat idea in your opinion, or is there some substance to that? No, I think it's insane. Yeah. I'll, I'll just tell you directly. And here, here's why, um, because they may have an unlimited money printer and unlimited access to credit, but they don't have unlimited Bitcoin. Okay. Look at the, look at the reserves on most of these exchanges, how much Bitcoin is there. If there's a run on the on the Bitcoin bank, if there's a run on the exchange, that Bitcoin can get cleared out insanely quickly. I mean, I was looking earlier this year, there was one point on the Coinbase order books where there was just a few thousand Bitcoin to well over six figure Bitcoin, a few thousand, right? So if you had somebody with decent amount of capital on there who could go on, they could literally, you see these spikes, right? In the price action, they could literally go on there and buy up every Bitcoin on the order book in a short period of time. Now, order books are dynamic. They're not static. So you're going right. to see new coins flowing in and you're going to see new sellers. That's all fine. But what I'm saying is th there's just not that much Bitcoin on the exchanges. And the only way to suppress the price, you've got to hold Bitcoin and you've got to put those sell walls in place. So if you're going to tell me that uh, there's going to be mainstream institutional money that's going to buy a ton, ton of Bitcoin just to sort of put it there to help their, their derivatives products, to help their futures contracts, Sure, it can happen in the short run, but in the long run, if there's demand there from the general public, I think it's a disastrous strategy. Yeah, I I agree with you. And I think the uh, the understanding, I think a lot of the people that make that argument, I mean, I'd like to hear it from some of the people that believe that. Just We're to actually talking to Lawrence that. Lepard in January, so it'll be interesting because yeah. I know he's a big proponent of kind of their ability to mess with this. This is all completely auditable by anybody with a node. I can go on my node right now and I can, it can tell me exactly how many Bitcoins are in circulation. Yeah, I can, you know, some of these glass node guys can see all of them, I should say, can see exactly what these exchanges are holding and you can see what hasn't moved in the last five years. So yeah, it's going to be interesting how the Leviathan and Bitcoin clash goes. It's going to be very interesting. Uh, just one final thing on this, because I think, I think that human beings, uh, particularly the gold bugs, they, they really have trouble admitting when they're wrong. And uh, I think that's the problem with this. Like when the gold price just remains stagnant or you only have like, you know, I don't know, 15% year to date move on it or something like that. I think they look for a justification for why they're wrong. And they want to say, oh, it's because of manipulation rather than just ex admitting that that gold is being, uh, you know, uh, demonetized as we speak. Yeah. The other thing about gold bugs, and I say this, lovingly and with as much humility as I can is that Bitcoin is stealing their moment. Like they've been courting this hot chick for like 16 years <laughs> and she just showed some interest last week and then a new stud walked in and um, its name is Bitcoin. So Dan is calling gold bugs simps yeah, at this point. But they've been waiting for this devaluation environment, right? thinking gold's going to be the answer. And then here comes Bitcoin. And I think a lot of them are just butthurt. And uh, I think uh, a lot of them are coming around. But it's just, if you're a gold bug, um, it's hard for me to take you seriously if you're not at least intrigued by what Bitcoin is trying to accomplish. And, and, and yeah, I think as even since I've been involved, you've seen the narrative from gold bugs change dramatically. And, and I think that will continue. Right. Because Bitcoin is not just digital gold, it's digital gold and all these other things. Right. right? Yeah. So, so it's like it, it, it's it's really tough for them. And, and we won't even get into the silver bugs. That's a, another loss. <laughs> That's a, I was a gold bug back in like 2009 to 2015 or so. And then I had this realization that Bitcoin is like a thousand times better. So, uh, right. 
But I mean, I think especially for the older crowd, people that don't, you know, it, you know, neuroplasticity kind of dissip- dissipates as you're older and like understanding these new ideas, which are very nuanced, even though it's extremely similar to the argument for gold. It's almost exactly, it's exactly the same thing, except that this is better. And it's very hard to come to grips with that when you're 60 plus years old and you've had this, this idea for how the world works for those 60 years. And now this thing just seems like a joke because it keeps going up a thousand X or 20 X every five years and then crashing. And it just, it's very hard from that perspective. I can totally understand how hard it is to understand what, what meaning this has, you know, I, I can appreciate their position. Absolutely. Let's, uh, let's end with this topic. Um, do you define yourself as a Bitcoin maximalist? And if so, how do you define a Bitcoin maximalist? Okay, so I, I don't define myself as a Bitcoin maximalist. I call myself a Bitcoiner. And the reason for that is because I think that people are all over the place as to what it means to be a Bitcoin maximalist. When I say I'm a Bitcoin maximalist, I think some folks think that I have to sell all my chairs and live in a van. That's not what I'm, uh, that's not how I view Bitcoin maximalism. Um, I prefer the term Bitcoin money maximalist, meaning that I think that there can only be one money. Me gusta. I love that phrase. Yes. Um, and, and, and the reason for this is that I think that ultimately uh, a monetary system gravitates towards the one. It gra- gravitates for, uh, to eliminate friction and to recognize one thing as value monetarily. Now, there's always going to be other things that have value in society, from your house to your car, to equities and companies, to collectibles. They're all going to be out there. They're all going to have value. And I don't begrudge anyone, whether you want to you know, collect Marvel comic books or NFTs or all these other things, go ahead. I, you know, I trade stock options all the time. I, I buy equities. I enjoy them. None of them, I think, are going to come anywhere near the growth rate of Bitcoin because I think Bitcoin becomes the global reserve asset that is preferred. Um, but I really, from a, from a standpoint of how I would prefer Bitcoin maximalists to view this, a Bitcoin maximalist is someone who believes that Bitcoin will eventually become the only global money, the one true global money for the planet. And there will, other, there will be other things that have value, but they're not going to be Bitcoin. Well said. Yeah, I, I think what really had a deep impact on me, because um, we both owned a lot of shit coins. We were always, the two of us were always Bitcoin first and Bitcoin forward. But we were taking you know, this diversified approach, thinking that was the way to go. Hearing Breedlove write and speak about the centripetal force of monetary networks and network effects um, really got to me. And I think we share a lot of the same conviction you do. I'll, I'll read this. This is a tweet. We, we responded to somebody the other day and we said, on the BCB pod, we consider ourselves protection Bitcoin maxis. We want to avoid dogmatism and vitriol, but our demographic, the middle class, does not have money to waste on hollow assets and impulsive trading. It's our mission to help. So we feel we must caution. And I think we're going to keep our eyes and ears open. We're not going to exclude any conversations. But at this point, if you're interested in growing your wealth and your buying power, this seems like the only viable and likely option to succeed in this space without taking excess risk. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because, you know, again, I have a ton of, uh, you know, blue collar, regular people that are just, you know, uh, firefighters, policemen, people in my town that I talk to all the time about Bitcoin. And ultimately, I think what drives them to the shit coins or the altcoins, if you want to be nice to them, is because they look at Bitcoin, they say, oh, my God, it's $60,000. I can't afford a full Bitcoin. Yep. I, I know if Bitcoin 100 X's, it's going to be a lot of money, but I'm not going to be a, a, a Dogecoin multimillionaire, right? Um, I'm going to have a decent nest egg. And I think what drives them to is that they only have $1,000, $2,000, $5,000, and they put it towards these things because they think they can get overnight rich, right? It's just gambling. Yep. And um, it may work, right? I'm not, I know folks that it has worked for and, for and sure. I'm not going to tell them they're wrong because they, they have the dollars to send and cents to prove it and they bought Bitcoin with it. But what I'm telling you is that, um, you know, if it's too good to be true, it usually is. Bitcoin is the one exception to that rule. Everything else out there, I think it's very much likely that uh, you're, you're, you're probably going to bet on black and it's going to hit red and you're just going to lose the money you put in. So I can't in good conscience tell people to do that, but I don't begrudge people if they want to go out and do anything with their money, right? It's their money. I'm just not 
I'm not going to tell them it's a wise or prudent investment. I would never tell my dad to buy Doge or SHIB. You know, I would never do <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. I feel irresponsible and dirty telling him to do that. I think yeah. it's a Charlie Munger saying there's two rules to investing. Number one, don't lose money. And number two, see rule number one. And that's right. how I kind of view these things. You know, it's just an incredibly risky, very likely that you're going to lose your money. Yeah. I think what, what's interesting about my sort of investing background, and Josh can, uh, Josh can attest to this massively, I am, I am catastrophically risk averse. Uh, there's a, a number of influences in my life and things my family's lived through that have kind of shaped me this way. I'm an insanely risk averse investor, always have been, which I think in a lot of people's minds, it strikes them unusually. It, just, it, it hits them in a weird way that I'm, I'm so into Bitcoin. But I think I, I move that sort of investing perspective into my, my Bitcoin perspective. And um, yeah, there's just so much risk in these other crypto products. It's, it, it's hard to wrap your head around, especially when we're in a, in a bull market like this. What, what could happen when liquidity dries up in a lot of these worthless tokens? Yep. Well, the risk is it goes to zero, right? And yeah. the risk is that if you had $1,000 or $5,000 and that was your hard-earned money and that's all you had, you, you have nothing now. You just gambled away the only thing you had to, to save with. And, and that's unfortunate because I think a lot of people do that. And uh, you know, I know friends and family that have you know, lost to, in the last bear market, lost a bunch of money betting on some of these things, coins that you guys probably uh, have never even heard of, Aurora coin. I know guys who lost thousands of dollars on Aurora coin, they'd be worth you know, that tens of millions that they just bought Bitcoin. Um, so you know, it's frustrating and you're never gonna be able to tell people, you, you're never gonna uh, try to, you're never gonna force them to be prudent with investment decisions. They just kind of have to get burned what I always say is that there's nothing makes a Bitcoiner uh, like a bear market in the altcoin world. I think that's mm -hmm. really the, the time where you get the most people to shift out of this mindset of stop chasing the, the quick, you know, 100x return. Yes, absolutely. Well said. Bitcoin money maximalist. <laughs> Bitcoin money maximalist. We really appreciate your time and uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, it was, it was a pleasure, guys. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Uh, I feel like we didn't even get to some of this stuff. Uh, uh, the IRS and the infrastructure bill laws. We'll have to do it again sometime and chat more. I really, really love chatting with you guys. Yeah, we we will certainly schedule something again in the future because I yeah, I think we hit just the tip of the iceberg. Agreed. Absolutely. Well, it's exciting. I'm, I love your podcast. I will uh, look forward to coming on again. Thank you. We look forward to having you. Thanks. Take care, guys. Thanks for listening into the show. If you enjoyed this discussion, be sure to subscribe on whatever app you're using for podcasts. And if you have an extra minute, go ahead and leave us a review. You can also follow us on Twitter. We're at blue underscore collar BTC. We invite questions, comments, and inquiries of any kind. And our email is blue collar Bitcoin podcast at gmail.com. We look forward to you joining us next time on the blue collar Bitcoin podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah.